Okay, so let me uh, show you this just to reiterate this point that I have just told you. So some of the earliest wars that we know from Russian come from this chronicle, right, uh, written by Nestor that you see in this picture here. So, откуда есть пошла русская земля? These are some of the first words that we know of, you know, that are written in Russian date to the 12th century AD. So, for example, when Nestor was writing this chronicle, uh, you know, if we came up to him in the 12th century and we said, okay, you know, откуда is an adverb, есть, пошла, are verbs, русский is an adjective, земля is a noun, he probably wouldn't know what an adjective is or what a noun is, but yet he was still using Russian language very actively. Or we would say, okay, in the word, you know, Ruska, Rus is the root of the word, Sk is a suffix, Aya is an ending. You know, you would say, what's a suffix? I don't know what you're talking about. I don't do any of these weird things, but I just use the Russian language and I use it pretty well. We did not start doing all this, all these kind of blue arrows and this analyzation until the 18th century. Okay, 18th century is when Russians began to do these weird things to the words, like began to analyze like what's called a grammar. Okay, we didn't have grammar as a discipline until about the middle of the 18th century, but yet we were using language. And this is what Levi Strauss is saying, look, you know, if we look at things like religion, if we look at things like myth, if we look at things like uh, language also, you know, uh, we began doing this to the language and figured it out and we figured out the rules. We need to begin doing these type of things to other cultural phenomena and we'll figure them out. We'll figure out the rules just like we have figured out the rules for language. And so what he did, he started with myth. He took myths from different countries, from different ethnicities, and started breaking them down like that. Okay. And so what did he find in this type of analysis? Uh, let's move on to question number four. He, what he does first is he breaks down this myth into its smallest units, kind of like phonemes that we talked about. The smallest units that don't mean anything by themselves, but when you combine them with each other in a certain way, in a certain sequence, they start making sense. And just like in language, they were called phonemes, he calls these ones mythemes. Okay, so he breaks down a myth into mythemes and then tries to figure out the structure of a myth. And he actually did that, uh, he did a comparative analysis where he, you know, didn't just analyze one myth, but he analyzed a bunch of myths and figured out that they all have the same structure, just like linguists figured out certain rules of languages by comparing different languages to one another. And let me just give you uh, one small example and uh, his analysis is more complex than that, but I'll show you some of the simpler kind of techniques that he used. Give me just one second here. So for example, he took <clears throat> these two myths, I guess we can call them fairy tales. <clears throat> um, Cinderella, which you all know which is, you know, in its modern version, for example, the version that you see in cartoons, uh, that's, kind of, that's a French, French fairy tale, <clears throat> even though its roots date all the way back to like ancient Egypt. But anyway, he took this French fairy tale, Cinderella, and he took a Nordic Norwegian fairy tale that's called Ashlad. And this Ashlad dates all the way back to Scandinavian sagas at the time of the Vikings. And he compared the two. And what he did, he broke, again, he broke the, these myths down into these myth themes. And then he started playing around with replacing, mixing up different myth themes. So for example, he took kind prince in Cinderella and replaced it with evil prince. 
He took boy in Ashland and replaced it with girl. He took white horse, replaced it with black horse, and so forth and so on. So he went through two of these fairy tales and replaced these myth themes with their opposites. <clears throat> and he basically arrived at the mirror images. Okay, he found out that these two fairy tales have the same structure. Like once you go through, you take Ashlad and you replace all of these myth themes with their opposites, you actually get Cinderella. And when you take Cinderella and replace all of these myth themes with their opposites, you get Ashlad. Okay. And so this is what his principle is based on of binary oppositions on this type of analysis. Um, okay. So I think we are kind of done with this reading. Now let's actually talk briefly about uh, what I had you guys read. And before I do that and start thinking about that, remember that canvas exercise when you guys went over the two myths, the Australian Aborigines myth and the Native American Eskimo myth and compared and saw what was the same, what was different. <clears throat> If we take this particular example of like Ashlet and Cinderella, you know, some people may say, well, it was just the result of cultural diffusion, you know, basically of this same fairy tale traveling through time and space, right? Like maybe one person invented Cinderella and then the Cinderella myth just kind of spread all throughout the world. It's unlikely, but even if that's true, why was this uh, fairy tale, why did it go through these particular transitions and not other types of transitions? You know, so this uh, kind of law or rule of binary opposition still holds because even if it was a result of diffusion, why did this myth undergo these particular transformations and not other types of transformations? Okay, so now let's move on to back up with the Conkey article. So we stopped on the fact that, um, and you, you guys there obviously can see some cave paintings. Uh, this is from the Lascaux cave, um, one of the caves that was actually included in uh, uh, Conkey's or I guess in Leroy Graham's uh, analysis. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, we stopped, you know, at this question, uh, question seven, I believe. I hope you guys can access your uh, questions. So question seven, you know, we said, how did uh, Goran begin to divide all of these symbols, you know, into what kind of groups? We said he divided the cave into certain parts or caves because he looked at a bunch of caves, not just one cave. And then we said he divided the symbols into different groups. You know, one group included animals and the other group inclu included everything but animals. So humans, uh, hands, different signs, symbols and stuff like that. So we said he divided the animals into different categories like A, B, C, D, you know, A, B being the most central, the most prevalent ones, um, the most often occurring ones <clears throat> and C, D, was a sort of these complementary animals that occurred less often and uh, they were less centrally placed within the caves. And we stopped discussing this class too, you know, everything but, um, everything but animal images. So all of, the, all of that other stuff that's not animals. And uh, the question was, you know, what did he divide that category into um, or I guess what two major categories did he divide uh, those types of symbols into? So can anyone answer that? So lines, human shapes, hands. Um, and the answer to that is on page 144. Uh, I believe uh, next to the last paragraph. So towards the bottom of the page.
Vlad, go ahead, please. Uh, so he divided them to um, gender categories, male, female, science, science, um, uh, and um, to other gender science, he divided to full and thin. And then I don't understand to so I have how he divides them. So full was like ovals, triangles, uh, some close figures to understand, and thin was sly uh, lines and things like that. But then I didn't understand why he did it. I understand with female and male figures. That's two good points you bring up there. Uh, first is you're right, he divided them into, you know, the male and female categories. And what got him thinking about that um, is sort of seeing some of the obvious, I'm gonna mute you for just a second, Vlad, but uh, some of the, he saw some obvious male and female, basically genitalia. Okay, and let me show you kind of what he meant. Um, so, for example, you know, this image to the left, you know, you obviously see like a male, you know, uh, basically a male genitalia there. This type of stuff, you know, he uh, translated as a, as a female, you know, genitalia, this sort of pubic triangle that you see there on the right. So these types of signs, you know, sort of got him thinking at first about uh, the male and female sort of essence, you know, present in the caves. And so all of these symbols he divided into categories. And uh, I had the same question as Vlad actually, you know, when I was reading this. So he says, okay, there are two categories. One is the female category. He also calls it full, F-U-L-L, -L, right? Like full, full category. And the other is a male category and it's thin, thin, right? So in the full category, he puts wounds, like a wound, right? When you're being wounded, he considers that as a female. He associates that with a female. Uh, ovals, he associates ovals with females. Triangles, he associates them with females, which kind of makes sense because, you know, if we like go to restrooms sometimes, male and female signs, are these triangles. I don't know if you guys seen, seen those, uh, you know, a triangle pointing down is a female sign and a triangle pointing up is a male sign. Have you ever seen those? Like if you go to a restroom, to a bathroom. So anyway, so he associates triangles with the females, rectangles he associates with females. So all of these types of signs are considered full to him and he associates them with a female category. And then straight lines, uh, hooked lines, uh, dots, series of dots, he associates with males. And you know, this is one of the maybe criticisms or, you know, it's up to you guys. It's sort of an opinion kind of, a, you know, do you agree with that? Do you not? Uh, but that's how he approached this analysis, you know, so for him, um, that's how he did it. So he divided these symbols into male and female. Okay, um, let's move on to the next question. Uh, I believe we should be on number eight. Um, Tatiana, if you have access to that, can you read number eight for us? Uh, okay. So number eight is what patterns did he find in the end? Okay, so sort of what, uh, you know, what did he find in the end? What kind of conclusion did he come to at the end of his analysis? And that should be on uh, page 145. And the third paragraph, there is a quote um, by Leon. So I think the answer is there. 
So if you guys have the text, if you go to page 145 to the third paragraph, you can even read some parts of it or just read it and give your interpretation. Tatiana, go ahead, please. Uh, so he found out that standard cave contains statements that life and death depend on each other, that males, weapons, and deathly animals are opposed to females. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, and can you read more of that? Uh, yeah, okay. Animals traditionally hunted by Lilithic people and wounded and dying people or animals. The two fundamental assumptions, one inflicting pain and death and the other suffering pain and death, are essential to each other in providing life. Thus, Magdalenian logic linked women and wounded bison, horses, and ibex. And and propose them to man, lion, and bear, while seeing all within a single paradigm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so basically, you know, he comes to this, uh, to the binary oppositions, right? Something that we talked about when we read just the general kind of overview of structuralism, because that's what structuralists are all about, about these binary oppositions. They say, this is how we construct our reality as humans. So what this quote is saying is, you know, what uh, Leroy Gurin found is uh, he found these oppositions, you know, male and female, um, hunted animals and hunters, um, weapons and wounds, uh, inflicting pain and suffering pain. So a hunter is inflicting pain and the, the animal is suffering the pain. Uh, then uh, experiencing death, so an animal is dying, versus providing life, because uh, some of these animals are pregnant. So all of these kind of binary oppositions <clears throat> are all co-present. So that's the important part, because, you know, we won't find any cave where just female symbols and no male symbols, for example. They're always next to each other. Uh, so for Leroy Gurin, this all combines into this one sort of picture of the world, right? So he found those patterns. Uh, let's move on to question number 10, uh, or I guess question number nine. Jana, can you read that one for us? Um, yes. So what are the four criteria that make this account uh, structuralist? Structuralist. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's try to answer that one. Uh, that's also on page 145. And those are actually listed by numbers on page 145, uh, fourth paragraph. Yana, if you have the access to the text, can you read uh, them off to us? Yes, uh, so the first one is that uh, the individual units have meaning only by virtue of their relations to one another. The images do, do not have a substantial meaning, only a relational one. Um, the second one is that the actual content of the art is for the most part bracket off. The B, bison and horse, full sign and thin sign, could be replaced with entirely different elements and the same mythogram, mythogram could be there. The third one is that uh, the obvious meaning of the art and imagery is refused and uh, certain deep structures not apparent, not apparent on the surface were sought. 
And the last one is that since the particular contents are in theory, um, are, are in theory re replaceable, and this was shown within the second class of figure science, human's hands, there is a sense in which one can say that content of the art is its structure. Thus, in a way, the imagery is about itself. Thank you. So yeah, this kind of, you know, um, again, is a repeat of what we read in the earlier reading when we just read about sort of the general statements about structuralism. So here, uh, Leroy Goran follows exactly those assumptions, or I guess those characteristics of structuralism. So the first one that Jana read is um, about basically, you know, the individual units are meaningless by themselves. So according to Leroy Goran's interpretation, if we just take a horse and just look at the horse by itself, at the symbol of a horse, it means nothing. Only when it's combined, uh, you know, so it's like this metheme or phoneme, unless it's combined with another phoneme, it does not make a word, it does not make a meaning. So, uh, so you have to read the whole cave. You know, you can't just take a fragment, a small phoneme, one symbol out of the cave or take a line, you know, and if you take this line and keep looking at this line, there is no meaning to it unless this line is then combined with other lines or horses or whatever it is. So the second criteria that makes this uh, analysis structuralist is uh, the actual content. Um, well, actually the second one is that these methemes or these phonemes, they can be replaced and the meaning will not change. So for example, if I went through the cave and replaced all of the horses with bisons and replaced all of the bisons with horses, I would get the same exact story. Okay, so playing on these binary oppositions, if we replace one with the other, as long as we keep this binary structure, that won't change anything, that will not change the meaning. Uh, the third criteria is that the obvious meaning of the art is meaningless. Uh, you know, and that kind of uh, talks about the same thing as the fourth criteria. So basically what he's saying is that the actual message is not that important. What's important is the structure. And so with that in mind, let's uh, move on to the last question that will help us, you know, open up these last two criteria better. So this last question, uh, Julia, maybe you can read it off to us, uh, number 10. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so if it wasn't a sympathetic magic, what was it? Yeah, so let, let's try to answer that. So, you know, the previous criteria before Leroy Guren started his analysis, like we said, was that it was kind of this voodoo, you know, sympathetic magic. You drew a horse, you threw a spear at a horse, whether the spear was a real spear or like a drawn out spear. And that's how you ensure successful, a successful hunt, for example. So Leroy Guren says it's not that, that's not the meaning. So what is it? you know, what is his conclusion? What are cave paintings? What do they mean? And I know this article is kind of dense. I mean, it's uh, not easy to sort of understand from, yeah, Tatiana, go ahead. So maybe from as like, he's a structuralist and it deals with language also, it came from language, maybe it is considered a prototype of a written language. That's not what he says. Let's try to stick to the reading, but good thinking, you know, you're thinking along the right lines. I wouldn't say a language, but I would definitely say a text because for, uh, or similar to a text, because for structuralists, Every creation of a human mind is a text of a sort that we need to read. So like, you know, those parallels with the text are correct, but I don't think anywhere he says that it's actually a language and we just read it, you know, like we do a written language. 
but it it's similar it's similar so let's try to unpack that uh, so any other thoughts on this or not thoughts but i guess what does the text say about this so the answer that i'm looking for is on page 146 in the second paragraph in the second half of the second paragraph So, uh, Jana, maybe you can read that one off also for us. Uh, do you mean the whole passage? Yeah. Uh, no, so, okay, so page, page 146, second paragraph, yes. and second half of it, like, you know, the second half of the second paragraph. So, um, the system that he originally elucidated corresponds more closely he suggested to the framework of myth than to the traces of magical operations but from the very beginning he didn't claim that it was a mythological content that he had eluci elucidated rather it was a container a mythographic vessel or a, or uh, an infrastructural figurative framework that could serve over over many millennia and many kilometers, not as an articulation of identical concepts, but as a basis for an infinitive number of uh, detailed moral symbols and practices. The details of this, uh, the details of this, we may never know. And to the structure list reading, their subsidiary, if re relevant at all. Yeah. So that last part is very telling. You know, the details of it we'll never know. And to a structuralist, that's not important. And that's subsidiary, meaning like secondary. So, you know, what they're saying is uh, the actual meaning, like what it actually meant, we, we don't know and that's okay. And we'll never know, probably, you know, we'll never know because we can't, we don't have a time machine. We can't go back and ask this uh, person who drew this, like what exactly does it mean? We don't know. What's important for a structuralist is that it's, it's not random and there is a structure and the structure is based on binary oppositions. So once they figure this out, that's sort of the main conclusion. And that's the most important conclusion for a structuralist. So, you know, there are these terms that are kind of confusing, you know, that he says like it is definitely not sympathetic magic it has more of a structure of a myth is what he says, you know, according to his structure, it more resembles a myth, but then he says it's like a mythological vessel that contains all kinds of symbols that you can pull out of there and use and combine and recombine and stuff like that. So, you know, I guess what he's saying is, uh, you know, it's like a, it's like a, let's say we, we found a script, a language script, but we can't figure it out. But we know that it's a script. So let me show you an example really quick. So <clears throat> like here you see images of a script that we don't know what it means, right? In the world, this is uh, from the Harappan civilization in the Indus Valley, right? Uh, so archeologists discover these sort of tablets made out of clay, made out of metal. And on these tablets, we see this kind of stuff, right? So we see this stuff. Like, we know that it's a script. Okay, but we don't know what it means. This is similar to what Guran is saying, you know, that uh, we know it's a script, but we don't know what it means. And, uh, but back to Tatiana's, you know, um, comment, he doesn't say that it's a language, you know, he says it's, it's closer to a myth. It's like if you were telling me a myth and you drew it out in drawings like a comic book, something more similar to that rather than to an actual like written script. So that's kind of, I think, the most that we will get out of Leroy Goran on this.
get to the video, let me just show you a couple of more slides. So like this one is, you know, the analysis that was in your article. This is an analysis that he did of another cave that's in another article. And talking about shapes, remember Tatiana, you had a question like the, the shape of this cave is really different uh, from the other cave. It's like a big tube that just keeps going and going. <clears throat> and you see, you know, Guren's analysis here, he counts, you know, you see these little numbers written down next to each symbol. He counts them up. These punctuated lines is where he divide the caves. He divides the cave into different parts. So you kind of, you know, uh, get to see his method. And I think it's a drawing actually by him personally. So I think that's kind of cool. You don't see much stuff like that in uh, modern publications. So these images that we saw, Okay, <clears throat> while you watch this video that I'll show you, think about this question. What evidence in this video argues against the sympathetic magic hypothesis? Okay, so just keep that question in mind. Um, what is it about this video that you see that counters this idea that it was sympathetic magic? So give me just one second, let me bring up the video and we'll watch some of it. And this is from, again, the Lascaux cave which is sort of uh, the superstar of all caves because it's so huge and has these different chambers and, and uh, parts and stuff like that. But there are way more caves just like Lascaux. It's just Lascaux got the most publicity sort of. Striking aspects of Paleolithic cultures. In the Combarel cave, one gallery is so low and narrow it can only be reached by crawling and yet it was decorated for a full 250 meters from the cave's entrance. Uh, just a quick comment. Uh, they talk about different caves here. They jump back and forth. So like most of it is on Lascaux, but you'll see some other cave names too. You don't need to remember them or anything like that. Whereas many prehistoric inhabited sites appeared to be regular catacombs, at Lascaux, very few animal bones were found in the cave. The painters and inhabitants seem to have brought a bare minimum of food to sustain them while working underground. The meat of deer, boar, horse, and in particular reindeer, the most hunted animal in the region. Prehistoric man used reindeer antlers to fashion spearheads, several of which were found in the cave. The reindeer had a central place in everyday life, but curiously, it is the only animal not to appear among the cave paintings of Lascaux. Unless this indistinct carving in the chamber of engravings can be interpreted as a reindeer. The largest animals of Lascaux are aurochs, wild oxen now extinct, but the forebears of domestic cattle and el toro of the bullring. The last recorded auroch to live in the wild was killed in Poland in the early 17th century. Several animals close to the aurochs have been bred by crossing different domestic species. The male would have been a powerful animal measuring more than two meters at the shoulder. The female was much smaller and had a finer head and horns. The prehistoric bison was much bulkier than its descendant, the European bison, and its horns were also much larger. The scene in the main gallery may be a portrayal of a challenge between males during the spring mating season. One of the two bisons is molting, its dark winter coat falling off in clumps to reveal a lighter reddish coat. The two animals are close, but facing away from each other, their tails erect, a sign of anger. This we can also see in the bison in the shaft and several carvings. 
Horses, large and small, abound at Lascaux, as in most decorated caves and shelters. Some have a dark M-shaped top coat with a lighter underbelly. They are often depicted with lines on their shoulders, a trait found in the Prowalski horse, an endangered wild horse limited only to Mongolia, where it was recently reintroduced into the wild. Others resemble the tarpon, the now extinct long-legged horses of the steppes. Others resemble modern ponies. One horse is grazing, another rolling on the ground. Others are jumping or rearing on their hind legs. One galloping horse has its ears pricked forward, a sign of attention. Another, fallen on its back, has its ears pinned back, a sign of fear. Pictures of deer are abundant. Some of the antlers were made to look even more impressive by the painters. Double branches, top branches, and sometimes widely spread tines. In the painted gallery, two mountain goats face off. In the main gallery, a herd of old males walks in line. A small bear is apparent in the ventral line of one of the aurochs. In the deepest part of the cave, two panels depict a number of felines. Round ears, square muzzle, and a tufted tail. These are undoubtedly cave lions. One appears to be springing. The other roaring, maybe spitting blood. He is spraying urine to mark his territory. Both lions bear an arrowed sign. In the shaft, a woolly rhinoceros. Paintings of this once widespread bicorn were also found in caves at Rouffignac and Combe d'Arc. Auroch, bison, horse, deer, mountain goat, bear, lion, rhinoceros. The Lasco menagerie is common to many other prehistoric caves. Several flat or hollowed stones were also found at Lascaux. Some of them dyed red or yellow. These are thought to be mortars. Others are pots for powders or paints. A hundred or so color-producing stones were found in the cave. Some show signs of wear. They may have been used to draw directly onto the walls. Or they were scraped with flint to produce colored powders, piles of which were discovered during the earliest explorations. Manganese oxide is a black mineral, often naturally present in the caves. Sharpened to a point, it produces a thick black line. Ochre is dried clay, dyed red or yellow by iron oxide. There are numerous such deposits in the region. Ochre was used to tan hides, dye clothes and color domestic objects. It was probably also used to decorate hunting weapons as makeup, body paint or tattooing. Ochre certainly had a role in rituals as it has been found at prehistoric shrines and altars. Red ochre may have been assimilated with blood, the case with certain peoples today. Prehistoric man used neither blue nor green. White, despite its ready availability at Lascaux, was not used either. The palette was limited, but the hues were subtle and many. Yellow ochre produced colors ranging from pale yellow to bright brown. Red ochre from orange to violet. Manganese oxide, depending on its density, gave gray browns, metallic grays, or jet black. Many of the figures are monochrome, but some are painted in two colors, yellow and black. Red and black. 
the quadrangular signs in the main gallery group the three basic colors of the Lascaux palette, red, yellow, and black. In the scene with the fallen bison, the animal on the right was first painted in red, then traced over in black to give a variation in tone. In the Great Hall of the Bulls and the Painted Gallery, the animals are outlined on the brilliant white background of the cave wall, punctuated with bare yellow limestone and the brown-red substratum. Despite the few colors used, the overall effect is one of polychrome. The orange and red glow of the torches would have made the blacks even darker while bringing out the richness and brilliance of the reds and yellows. Each surface required particular techniques. In the chamber of engravings and the main gallery, the limestone is generally smooth and crumbly. Pictures like the frieze of the deer were drawn rather than painted with a manganese oxide block for the first four heads and dark brown clay for the fifth. The drawing is based around a central X, an abstract motif running throughout the frieze. In the Great Hall of the Bulls and the Painted Gallery, several of the figures are coloured with subtle, gradual shading. Two techniques were used to accomplish these effects, spitting and blow painting. Spitting was still until recently the favoured technique of numerous hunter-gatherer peoples, such as Australian Aborigines and Kalahari Bushmen. This was the technique used for some of the oldest known rock paintings, stenciled hands. Although widely practiced in other caves, this technique seems to have been rarely used at Lascaux. 